be seated. Mike and Angie, I'll pick on you again. It's so good that you brought your son with you this morning, invited him. Sir, we are thankful that you are here this morning. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we have been, go to Matthew chapter 6 and also Luke chapter 11, uh, but we'll, the first verse will be in Luke, but we have been looking at, for I believe this is the eighth message right here on prayer that we have been studying and looking at uh, some of the prayers of the Bible. I believe we have looked at David, we have looked at uh, Jesus, uh, some of the instruction that he gave be- Kind of before you approach prayer, we looked at that last week and he said, kind of pray this way, do not, do not pray this other way, do not be like uh, uh, the, the world, do not be like the hypocrites, do not be like the Pharisees, the scribes, do not be like the Gentiles, do not pray uh, to little g gods, do not pray to idols, do not pray to graven images, do not be like a hypocrite that wants to be seen in the marketplace that just breaks out in prayer at a certain time of the day and bows toward Mecca or toward the east or toward wherever and is in prayer in that manner uh, that way. He says, don't do it for show. So Jesus gave some instructions even leading up to prayer and we look at that last week as well. And also I told you that in the life of a Jew, there are, there are about three things that are just burned into the Jew's DNA. And, and those three things would be tithing, fasting, and prayer. Now, if you look at Luke chapter 11, you're going to see a little variation to to the prayer that we're going to read that we even began to look at last week. But you come to Luke chapter 11, and there's a, a variation in the way the prayer is written out, but do not be bothered. Don't let that Uh, variants bother you greatly. It just has to do with translation and where they got it, how it came to them. But in Matthew chapter 6, you have the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus is teaching the disciples. He's not only teaching the disciples, as a matter of fact, he's in the middle of the sermon and he kind of breaks away and he talks to the disciples to pray this way. And you you might say, well, that that prayer doesn't look like the same one in, in Luke. And I told you, don't don't, don't let that bother you too greatly right there. It's just, it's just a matter of translation. But, so he breaks away from the sermon and he gives the disciples a little bit of instruction on prayer. Pray this. Do not pray this way. Pray like this right there. Pray like this in this manner. And, and the disciples are there. The, the uh, expanded group of 70 is there. And really even beyond that, we looked at this last time too, even beyond that, the multitude is there on the hillside while he's giving this sermon. Now the funny thing is that Jesus takes time. They even ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus takes time, gives them instruction On prayer, more than once, multiple times, he gives the disciples instruction on prayer. And if you look through the Gospels, you never find the disciples praying. It is odd. It is odd. But even in the garden, Jesus asked them to do what? In the garden, Jesus asked a few of the disciples to do what? To pray. And what did he find them doing? Exactly, just what you're going to be doing in about five minutes, right? No, no, you're good people. So yes, he did. He found them sleeping. So even they ask about it, but they had trouble with it. They had trouble praying themselves. They themselves fell asleep in prayer. Uh, Jesus says, don't pray like the hypocrites or the Gentiles. Now Luke chapter 11 Verse 1, it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John has taught his disciples. So Jesus is in prayer, and the disciples notice this is different. 
His prayer is different. Why is his prayer different? He's not praying like the hypocrites, right? He's not praying like the Pharisees. He's not praying like the Sadducees or the scribes or the Sanhedrin. He's not, he's not doing it in the same form form or the same manner or he's not using the same words that they were using and they're saying Lord teach us how to pray he the disciple this disciple has come and said Jesus teach us to pray the disciple asked teach us that teach us to pray he does not say teach us a prayer how many times do you hear people Pray that prayer in Luke 11 or Matthew 6. Some people, that is the only prayer that they will ever pray. And that's the only prayer that they pray. But the disciple does not say, Jesus, teach us a prayer. He says, teach us how to pray. So Jesus is going to teach them a way to pray. Now back to Matthew 6. Our prayers, our prayers, think about this, our prayers probably change us more than anything else. Our prayers often change us more than anything else. You can debate that prayer changes the outcome of something, but, but it's quite possible that prayer often changes our outlook on something more than it changes the outcome of the event, of the circumstance, of the situation. So chapter 6, verse 9. Pray then in this way, our Father. Now, he said, Jesus says, pray this in this way, our Father. Father is for everybody. That's for everybody can come to him as Father. And whosoever will may come as Father. You can come to Him. You can approach Him. You can say, Father. So that's showing, Jesus is showing that God is available to everybody. There is nobody that God will shun or nobody that God will, will not welcome in to the, to the family, to His family. That There is nobody that God will not welcome as a child of His. Jesus did not say, He is my Father only. Jesus did not say, you cannot pray to him as father. That's only reserved for me. Jesus shows them that you can come to him as father. It shows that God is the father. He is for all people, but not all people will acknowledge and repent and accept him as Abba, father, daddy. Not all people will come to that in their life. So for Jesus to teach this, for Jesus to start his prayer that way, our Father, that was radical teaching for that day. They would, that, was, that was unheard of for them to approach God and say, Father, maybe 16 times in the Old Testament will you find God referencing as father but over 60 times in the new testament is that name given to god and he is called father so this is a change that jesus is showing here this is a change that is happening that he is giving them so our father who is in heaven what that's saying is you can approach him as god you can approach him as God even though he is in heaven. And since he is in heaven, he is like no other God. Our Father who is in heaven, he's like nothing else. He is like no other God. He is like no, nothing else. That's why he says no. That's why he says do not create a graven image. Do not create a graven image because other gods have images made after them. But God says don't make a graven image because nobody knows what I'm like. Nobody can describe me because of my greatness. Our Father who is in heaven, there is no other God in heaven but the one true God. Jesus says you can pray that way. Pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, he's, he, you can come to him individually. You can come to him personally and he is like no other because there is no other God that resides in a place called heaven. So Jesus says you can approach 
him in this way. Nothing else compares to him. Our God is a, a beyond comprehension, because, but he is still our heavenly Father. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. I can read this to you here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. Now see, that's a great thing to know, that you can be called a child of God. The love, God, the, the love of the Father has been stowed upon you so much so that you can be called a child of God, even though He is in heaven, even though there is nothing else that compares to Him, even though that, that anything else, any idol, any graven image, anything else you have seen that has tried to depict a God or, or Jehovah God, that does not, it doesn't resemble, it does not uh, it does not encompass all that he is. He says, he says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon his children so that you can be called children of God. Now that's a father. That's a father who loves you. That's a father who, who wants to have a relationship with you, who wants you to come to him in prayer. That is a, a picture of a God who is so great. It's a picture of a God that is, that is great, that no image will bring justification to him. And he says, because that is a God that is so great, he says, you can still be called my child. You can come to me as father, and you can be called my child. God is so holy that even in Revelation, the creatures say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is your name. That's how great God is that even creatures in, in, in heaven call out to Him. Since God is so holy, we should reflect His holiness. For Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 14 and 15. Now this may be something you want to write down and go back. Since God is so holy, we should reflect His holiness, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And that, that should be a good verse for us. That should be a verse that we apply to do all things without grumbling or disputing. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're an infant getting your diaper changed or if you're 100 years old, you're going to grumble and dispute about something, right? Infants dispute about getting their diaper changed. Are you guys awake this morning? Do we need to go back to the beginning? All right, well, if that's what you want. Uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. We'll start over. <clears throat> I know you're going to leave here in 20 minutes. You already, I heard somebody say that. You can st I heard somebody, somebody said, you can start where you want to, but in 20 minutes, I'm leaving. <laughs> You're grumbling. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of, of, of a crooked and perverse generation. So Paul says, don't reflect a crooked generation. Reflect something different. What I'm trying to get you to see is that your God is so holy that there is nothing else that matches Him. But yet, even though He is so holy, He calls you something, and that's a child. He calls you a child of His. It would be like, I mean, I mean probably in your mind, okay, let's, let's look at this. LeBron James. Does any, do, you know who, do you older people know who LeBron James is? Help me out. Okay, thank you. Pat says she knows who LeBron James is, so I'm assuming everybody else here does. Okay? LaWanda knows who LeBron is. Here's, what's LeBron doing right now? LeBron is looking. He's on the cusp of making the highest money ever recorded to any athlete besides a soccer player or something. Not a soccer player in this country, but, you know, those other places that play soccer. But LeBron James, I don't know what he's going to make, $50 billion a year or something like that. And where was he just vacationing on his private jet? Uh, one of those little islands out there in the Bahamas that got slapped by a hurricane. Anguilla, I think. He probably, had, probably bought a little piece of the island. It has his own little 
condo there. But he's vacationing in Anguilla and he flies back into Los Angeles yesterday and the Lakers are wanting to, to, to give him. And you've thought about that kind of money before. You've thought about the obscene amount. And, and you've thought, well, well, you know, if I was a, if I was a child that, whose parents had all this money and I didn't have to worry about anything and I could just, do you like shopping for cars? I don't like shopping for cars because it's always, always the car that I want is always just about $2,000 out of reach, right? The one you want is just always out of reach and you have to settle. But if you're LeBron James's kid, you don't have to settle for anything, right? If you're a famous movie star's kid, you don't have to settle for anything. We think if we can just, uh, if we can make it to the beach, once every other year or every now and then or eat a little fresh seafood, then life's good. And they're going on vacation in Anguilla, wherever that place is, you know, and they'll have fresh seafood flown into them wherever they go. And we think, well, that's good. That's great. But do you know the holiness of God, the greatness of God is beyond the greatness of the King James, LeBron. It's beyond that greatness. The greatness of God goes beyond that. And you're wishing you could be called a child of somebody else that's rich and famous, but you are the one you are the child of the one who owns it all, who owns eternity, who has eternity in his hand. He is so holy and so great, and yet he still wants to call you a child of his. That's good. Jesus says you can pray that way because that's your God. Do you know him that way this morning? Do you know him as that type of father for your personal life? Even as holy as he is, he still wants to have a relationship with you. I would never call LeBron James' father, Daddy Abba. My earthly father is gone. But I have a heavenly father who I can call that to. And he responds. Because he is holy, there should be a reflection of us, a reflection of him in us. The world should see that because Paul was saying, don't be crooked. Don't go around grumbling and disputing. Uh, prove yourself to be blameless, innocent. In the midst, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, because our God is holy, we should display some things about him, some characteristics, some attributes about God of holiness to a crooked and perverse generation. Paul says, don't be like them. Now, do you ever look up in the sky at night and check out, do you ever look up for the first star, starlight, star bright, first star I wish I see tonight, I wish I may, I wish I might have this wish, I wish tonight. You you ever look up and see that first star in the night? Well, if you look up this evening, the first bright thing you're going to see in the sky is probably not a star. It's going to be Venus because Venus is out, first thing out in the evening sky. And buddy, she's bright. She is bright. But here's what's, here's what's happening. Here's what Venus is doing. There's a science term called our Albedo, I believe it's albedo is the name of it. That describes the amount of sunlight an object reflects. Albedo, how much sunlight an object reflects. The albedo of earth is 30%. It reflects 30% of the sunlight uh, that the sun puts out because of clouds, because of moisture, because of rain, because of water. That's how much earth reflects. Mercury re has a 6% albedo. Now Venus is the, has the highest albedo in our solar system which is 75%. It reflects 75% of the sunlight that comes its way. Our reflection of the holiness of God should be a large percentage. We should not be confused Fused with a crooked and perverse generation just reflecting 6% of the holiness of God, we should stand apart as Venus stands apart out in the night sky. The first thing you see because of the holiness of God, I should reflect 75. I should be reflecting 100%, but come on. I should reflect a high percentage of the holiness of God into a dark world. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying. 
our reflection. We should have a reflection of God into a dying world. Uh, back to Matthew chapter 6 now, verse 10. He says, our Father in heaven. And then he comes and he says, he says your, will, your will be done is what he says. We like to move past that. We don't want to stay around your will be done. We like to move into verse 11 where it says, give me, uh, give me, give us. We like the give us part. But here in verse 10, he acknowledges your will be done. It means to trust God. Trust God with what you don't want to. Trust God with what you don't want to trust Him with. It, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, it means that you're going to trust God because He knows best. God, I'm going to trust God because you do know best. And since you know best, sometimes what I'm asking for, you may not give it to me. That's what He's saying. He's saying, Your will be done. So God, I'm trusting you, you know what's best, and sometimes that best for me is not what I will get. <clears throat> now when he says this, your will be done, it's not talking about a, uh, a fatalistic approach, or it's not talking about fate, uh, that would be an Islam teaching that, that it's, all, it's Allah's will, uh, whatever Allah wills is what will happen, that it's useless, that's not what Jesus is saying at all right there, but he's saying that, that you trust God with, you trust God with it, even though it may not be best for your life, what, what comes your way. Scripture does not teach, hey, don't pray to God. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Scripture does not teach that at all because what did Jesus even pray for himself? This was in Jesus' prayer for himself. Remember when he was in the garden, what did he pray in the garden? He said, not my will, but your will be done. So if Jesus, who has walked in the place that you have walked, if Jesus, who has experienced what you have experienced, if he comes and models that for us hey not my will but your will be done father we're going to look right here why did jesus say that jesus was even fully god and fully man and yet he still asked for that cup to pass by him not my will father but yours be done. Jesus knew what the will of the Father was. When Jesus was in the garden, did he or did he not know what the will of the Father was? He knew what the outcome was going to be. He knew that the sin of the world, your sin, my sin, was going to place the, be placed upon him, and the Father was going to have to turn his head from looking upon the Son at that time. And as Jesus is on the cross, he does not pray, Father, Abba, in that time, what does he say? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is crucified. He's placed in a tomb. That, that stone is rolled in front of that tomb. Everybody believes he is dead, but yet he is placed there, left for dead. But Sunday is coming, and he will rise again as king. I don't think you see what I'm saying. Jesus prayed, not my will but yours be done. He had to get through something that was gruesome. He had to get through a crucifixion. He had to get to the, one of the most in inhumane deaths ever recorded in history. But yet the Father's will was for him to go through that darkness because what was on the other side was King of creation was one who would be resurrected because no fault was found in him and who would be established as king of this dominion in his time. So if Jesus can submit, then we too can submit and say, your will be done, even though it may not be what I think is best. Verse 10, he says, your kingdom come. This is talking about when the world will bow at the feet of Jesus. When the world will acknowledge and confess that he is Lord. Now, the question is, are you prepared for that day? 
Are you prepared? If it was today, if you, are you prepared? Is your eternity prepared because you have said Jesus is Lord of Lords? Jesus is King of Kings. Jesus is the one who did this, who took this sin for me. He says, your kingdom come. You prepare for a lot of things. When you go on a trip, do you prepare for the trip? You do. You prepare for the trip. You pack your hairbrush, your, your makeup, you pack your clothes, your socks, uh, you pack your toothbrush. Uh, when you, you make preparations, don't you? You make preparations to go on a trip. What else do you do? You make preparations for the home. If you're going on a long trip, maybe you turn the water off. Maybe you turn the uh, electricity off to the hot water heater. Maybe you turn the pump off. Maybe you, uh, you, you adjust the thermostat at home. Nobody's going to be there. I don't need to have it this cold or this hot. We'll put it in vacation mode. You make arrangements when you're going on a trip. You make preparation before you go on that trip. I think you get where I'm going. Have you made preparation for a trip to eternity? Have you made that preparation? Because there's coming a day that his kingdom will come. His kingdom will reign. He will be seen that way and every knee will bow. Have you already bowed your knee to him? If not, you're going to walk out of here this morning into really a hopeless eternity. Make preparations. Be prepared for his kingdom is what he's saying. It will come. Now verse 11. After all that, then he gets to give us this day our daily bread. Now, it's, it's interesting that he does not say, give me my daily. He does not teach the disciples, you pray for you. Don't, he, doesn't teach them, he doesn't teach them to say, give me my daily bread. He, he, he says, give us our daily bread. We are to pray for others. We are to help others. We are to assist others. We are to depend on him daily for ourselves. For our provisions, and we are to use his blessings that he gives us to help others, to bless others. He has given you so much, and you are able to bless other people. Other people can benefit because God has blessed you. In your submission to God, you can anticipate his provision in your life. When you submit to God, you can anticipate his provision for your life. So he says, give us this day, our daily bread. That is his provision for you. He will take care of you. When you have submitted to him, when you come to him in this way, when you acknowledge him in this way, provision will come to you. You're not going to dry up. You're not going to wither up. You're not going to fade away. He's concerned for you because he is a father. You're concerned for your children. Your parents were concerned for you before you. You will be concerned for their children, for your grandchildren. That's a parental instinct. Is God not a parent as well? Is he not concerned for you? He is. God is concerned. For you, he will provide. He will provide what you need. And when you're in submission to him, you can anticipate his provision. So we think about that. As God has provided for us, uh, we're going to have an opportunity. This is another fifth Sunday for us in this month. At the end of this month, we'll, we'll take up a special offering. We'll take, and you've, you, we'll tell you where it's going. It's going to the uh, uh, Family Resource Center in Marshall County. You're familiar with them. They do work at Jonathan at South, I believe, is the two that we're going to partner with. But just to, they, they, they help children, whether it's sending them a little bit of food home on the weekend or over summer or having something for them to wear when they get to school or so, so school supplies. God's blessed you. This is just another opportunity. Another opportunity for us to give back because he has blessed us so much. 
So think about that. Think about what God has done for you. Think about this prayer that Jesus brings to us. Don't, you don't have to pray this verbatim, but pray in this way. Be a reflection of his holiness. Think about that tonight when the stars come out. Think about that when you're watching the fireworks go off for the next few days. Think about the brightness, the, uh, the illumination that they have in the sky. God, I'm to be a reflection of you. I am not to reflect a crooked and perverse generation. I'm to be different. I should be reflecting your holiness. Something for us to apply to our life as we walk out of here. This morning. And lastly, have you made that preparation for your eternity? You've prepared for everything else. You've been preparing your whole life for one thing or another. Whether you're preparing for school, preparing for college, preparing for work. But have you prepared for eternity? This morning you can confess it before men. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and stand this morning. So we have this final song, a closing song. If you have a prayer need, a concern, if you want to intercede for somebody, you want to stand in the gap for somebody and lift them up, I encourage you to come to the altar as we sing this last song. I'll pray with you. Be loved to pray with you in, a, in any manner. But if you need to, to make that preparation for your eternity, if you need to make that confession of, of where you're going to spend, of your need for that father. Remember, he is father. He's father. He's, he's, not, he's not a God at a distance. He's, he's not a God who, who uh, cannot be approached. He's a God who already knows, so just confess to him, just admit it to him.